Good morning, and go ahead and grab a seat, City Light Church. My name is Gavin. Good to be with you guys. And as you find your seat, please find in your Bibles the book of Philippians. We're going to be in chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. I am so excited to share with you the first sermon of 10 sermons in one of my favorite books of the Bible, the New Testament book of Philippians. Uh, As you turn your Bibles, I'll start with this. My wife and uh, Sarah and I have three kids, Grady and uh, Vivian and Levi, and they're six years old and younger. And in our house, um, we've been intentional to try to teach our kids how to use their words to show love and affection and, and you know, have a warm environment uh, in our house. And don't get me wrong, we're a typical house with little kids who fight and bicker and the whole drill. We're very human, but I am proud. I think our kids in general do a good job of creating a culture of love uh, and warmth towards each other with their words. And so uh, my youngest, Levi, his latest saying for the last couple weeks, um, like he'll hug me, and if he wants to, excuse me, communicate affection, he'll say, Daddy, you're the best daddy I've ever seen in the whole wide world. Cutest thing. If Grady does something nice or Vivi, he'll tell him, you know, Bubba, you're the best brother I've ever seen in the whole wide world. (laughs) Super, super cute. And so um, in our family, it's borderline obnoxious, like it's a little cheesy, and I'm just unapologetic uh, about that. But, you know, everyone always tells you, don't blink, the kids are going to be out of the house before you know it, you know, and you always hear the story, like, I never heard my dad tell me he loved me or he was proud of me. So I've like swung the pendulum. So like every day, 12 times, my kids hear, I love you, I'm proud of you, you're doing awesome, all of that. It's kind of over the top, but I don't care. That's just how... We're going to roll. And it's been neat to see the culture in our home. So Grady and I have this thing uh, where at bedtime, when he was little, like a few years ago, we read this book, um, The Little Brown Hair or Rabbit or something. I don't know. It's like a rabbit and his dad talking about how much they love each other. And it ends with, I love you to the moon and back. And so at bedtime now, Grady will tell me like, Dad, I love you to the moon and back 257 times. And I'll say, well, I love you to the moon and back 258 times. And he'll say, well, I love you to the moon and back. And then he just strings numbers together, making up numbers like 257, 29, 832. And he kind of, you know, um, tenses his face to communicate. And the numbers don't make sense. But, you know, he'll finish 239, 47 to the moon and back. And then he'll say, Dad, is that number bigger than your number? And <laughs> i say, yes, but I love you that much plus one. And all the veteran parents in the room now know, Gavin, yeah, that's not, like, he's just stalling bedtime. Like, he's not communicating affection. You know that, right? I want you to know, no, I'm hip to his game. I know what's going on. But listen, I don't care. If he wants to stall bedtime for five minutes telling me how much he loves me, I'm gonna let, I'll let that go on for 20 minutes, you know? Someday he's going to be gone. So, Grady, I love you to the moon and back. And I say that to say, as Paul starts his letter that he writes to the Philippian church, it's borderline obnoxious as we read the first 11 chapters today, how much warmth and affection this pastor and church planner has for his local church. I mean, you're going to hear in this letter, both in in the tone of the letter and the content, the words that he writes, how much love that the apostle Paul has for this church. And so Paul wrote a whole bunch of letters to churches in the New Testament. They all start off with a nice greeting, and he usually tries to say, you know, some nice thanksgivings and encouragements, and he usually says something nice with the exception of Galatians, which he was pretty upset about. But Philippians is different. I mean, it's the next level. He just gushes over this church, and Paul planted that we know of 14 different churches, I think maybe more than that, Uh, but I think it's fair to say that this was his favorite church. I don't know for sure. I'm speculating. But you listen to the way he talks about these people, both the leaders in the church and the members of the church. He loves this Philippian church. And it's, I said the moon and back thing because it's almost like that's what he's trying to communicate. It's just like 257 times to the moon and back. Like, church, I love you. And at the risk of sounding a little cheesy, we'll get through this. I want to say I can relate to Paul. I haven't planted 14 churches. We've only planted one church, Chris and I. But I think we would both say, like, we, you guys, this is more than a job. This is more than a Sunday religious tradition. You guys are like family to my family and to Chris and I and the whole thing. And I love this church. I can relate to Paul. Like, I like almost everyone in this room. I mean, I, almost all of you, I really like. And 
I love my city group, and I love, everyone's insecure. I'm just kidding. I like you all. It's not equally. Um, I like my city group. I like being here on Sunday mornings. I love the culture of joy and grace and hospitality and foundation, of all that stuff. And I love being here. So last summer, we took some vacation days, and, but stayed here to work on our house. And we thought, well, since I'm on vacation, we should go to another church just so I can be a dad and sit with my family. And that's kind of a rare privilege for a pastor. So we went to another church in town, and it was great. The sermon was great, really good. Um, and the music was great, and the people were great. And I thought, man, I would, I would send people to this church. It's a great church. And I left thinking, I love City Light. <laughs> like, that was awesome, but I just love the culture that God has created in and amongst us. And thank you guys for being a part of that. I think there's something really amazing when a community of people come together, and Jesus is authentically our center. We get together about him. We submit ourselves to him. He is our leader, and he shapes the culture. And what happens is a spiritual family is formed. And that's what we see in Philippians. This is an incredible church. And I'm so eager to learn from this church and Paul's letter to this church because as much as I love our church, I want us to even grow to be like this ideal church even more. And our commitment to the gospel, our love for one another, the spirit of mission and community um, <clears throat> that we experience here, I want to learn from this church. So this morning and the moments that we share together, we're just going to look at the first 11 verses. This is just Paul's introductory remarks. Uh, we're going to camp out here for the next 10 or so weeks. Uh, but first, I just want to be in the very introduction. What I want to do, I just want to pull out three observations, so imagine that, uh, from the text this morning. And uh, I just want to let those observations and truths that we see from Scripture shape our own community here. And so if you have your notes, follow along there. Uh, first observation I want to make from our text this morning is that the church is an unlikely family. Write that down. The church is an unlikely family. Um, I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Read with me just the first two verses of our text. It says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ, so that's who wrote the letter. And uh, we're not going to talk about this today, but by the way, Paul is an unlikely church planter. And so uh, he used to make a living killing Christians, and now he is making a living pastoring Christians and planting churches. It's an unlikely church planter. Paul and Timothy is protege, servant of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. And by the way, if you have trusted Jesus, you positionally are right with God, and you are a saint uh, sainthood doesn't happen when you die and you perform miracles and you are venerated. Um, the Bible would say a saint is someone who has trusted the Lord. So if you know Jesus, call you Saint Mark, Saint Tim, Saint Chris, you know, Saint Nick. Um, to all the Christians who are in Philippi and the overseers and deacons, that's the leaders of the church, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We could preach a series out of everything that's um, in the, just the first two uh, verses. But what I want to draw our attention to is just how unlikely this is. Paul writing this letter to this church that got planted. And I want to draw a little bit on the history of this church plant in Philippi. Um, we read about the church plant in Philippi in Acts chapter 16. So since we're going to spend the better part of three months in this book, I want everyone to read Acts 16 this week. It's not long, and it's the story of the church plant in Philippi. So Really quick, as we talk about it being an unlikely family, let me just retell the story. So um, Paul and his buddy Silas are going to go plant a church, and they want to go to Asia. They think they're supposed to go to Asia and plant a church. Well, as they're getting ready to go on their journey and plant a church, Paul has a dream. And in this dream, there's this guy from Macedonia, and he's saying, hey, come help us in Macedonia. Macedonia was in Europe. It wasn't in Asia. So Paul wakes up from his nap. So Silas, I had this dream. It was this Macedonian guy saying, come here. And so they decide, you know what? I think the Lord's leading us to Macedonia. Let's go there. So they do. They change plans. They go to Macedonia, which is in modern day Greece. And the first city that they come to is Philippi. Philippi is a uh, Roman city. It's about the size of Papillion. And there were various pagan and Greek gods that were worshipped there, but there was very little Jewish presence in Philippi. We know that because every time Paul went into a new city to plant a church, where would he go? He'd go to the synagogue. He always goes to the synagogue, and he preaches the gospel there. In Philippi, he doesn't, which tells us there likely wasn't a synagogue. Uh, in the day, to, to formalize and crystallize a synagogue, you needed to have 10 Jewish men present. Uh, that formed a synagogue. There were likely not 10 Jewish folks there. So he goes to the edge of town, and he finds some ladies having a Bible study and a little prayer gathering. And they were most likely Greek women. They had come across a, a Bible. They had become hip to the Hebrew God of the Bible, the one true God, and they're praying to him. And that's where Paul goes first, and he preaches the gospel. 
that Jesus is that God who came to save his people from their sins and invite them into a relationship with himself. And the first person to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior is a gal named Lydia. Lydia was a wealthy business owner. She ran a big uh, business. She sold purple linens. She uh, had a big checkbook. She had a big house, and she had a big living room. And so gives her life to the Lord, and the church gets started in Lydia's living room. And she, in fact, underwrites much of the ministry of the church plant in Philippi. And so the church is there. It's Lydia, her family, Paul, Silas. Paul and Silas go out into the community and start preaching the gospel. Come across a young teenage slave girl who has been demon-possessed. The demon allows her to foretell the future, and so her slave owners are making money off of her as she fortune-tells people around them. Uh, it's a long, funny story. In Acts 16, they end up casting the demon out of this girl. Uh, well, that destroys her profitability for her slave owners, so they get all mad, have Paul and Silas thrown into prison. And by the way, we don't know this for sure. I'm speculating, but I sometimes wonder... Did that young teenage girl actually become a part of the church plant after she was ministered to by Paul in such a way? We don't know for sure. But Paul and Silas end up in jail. They've been beaten. They're worshiping the Lord at midnight. Uh, They have physical wounds on their body, middle of a cold Roman sail, and I love it. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I mean, there's a lot of things you could be saying. They're singing to King Jesus at midnight. God sends an earthquake, busts open their cell doors, they walk out. There's a jailer who was asleep that was supposed to watch them, sees they're gone, grabs a sword. He's ready to run it through because he knows his fate if they got away. Paul and Silas come running out. No, 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 we're not going to escape. We're still here. The jailer falls down on his knees, asks the question that we should all ask. What must I do to be saved? They preach the gospel. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And so he does. Jailer becomes a Christian. Crazy story. His whole family becomes Christians, and shortly thereafter, Paul and Silas get released from jail. And now you've got the core team to their church plan. You've got Lydia, this rich business lady in her household. You've got Paul and Silas. You possibly have a teenage, formerly demon-possessed slave girl. And you've got this suicidal, uh, blue-collar, work-in-the-graveyard shift at the jail and all of his family. I mean... (laughs) This is an unlikely spiritual family that has been formed. But isn't that what the gospel does? It takes people who otherwise have nothing in common that find commonality in the person of Jesus. I'll bet on any given Sunday afternoon, if you were to walk in and look into Lydia's living room, it was an eclectic, eccentric, unlikely potluck dinner after church on Sundays. And as I read this story of the church plant of Paul and and Philippi, I can't help but think of the history of our own little church. Three years ago, um, Chris and I and our friend Todd and Jack and just a handful of people sensing that the Lord would have us plant a new church. And we're praying, Lord, where? And we come across this building at 40th and Nicholas, and we think, perfect. We pray. And Jesus says, yes, go there. And we're so excited about it. And so we buy the building. And then we're so excited about it, we're like new parents that want to show off their little baby. And so, you know, we have pastor friends at other churches and big churches, and there's a church planning consultant in town, and we're like, hey, we're planning a church. Come look at our church building. We're so proud, you know. And we walk these big church pastors through it and church planning consultants, and you can see their excitement turn to concern as we walk through this busted building at 40th and Nicholas that we bought for $100,000. And You can tell they're trying to be gracious and kind and not take the wind from our sails. But at the end of it, the conversation with everyone was the same. Like, is it too late to get out of this? You know, (laughs) the church planning consultant actually said, if you could just board up the windows and walk away, you're going to save yourself a lot of work. And I, I don't know what the problem was. They, they mentioned there's no parking and there's one pink toilet and something about the flock of live bats in the sanctuary. I don't know (laughs) what was wrong with that, it was an unlikely place, but that's what Jesus does. He takes you to unlikely places, and then he fills in this building an unlikely family. I loved the early days, and I love what's still happening here, Um, but you just remember those early days where you've got rich people, poor people, blue collar, white collar. Um, You got homeless people in the church. We had a guy living in the church for three months for free in exchange for free labor. I mean, you're just figuring stuff out. It was an eclectic unlikely family. I'll never forget our first baptisms. We have a guy um, who wants to get baptized, and he's a police detective. And so he takes the gun out of his pants and puts it on the table and gives his life to Christ and is baptized. And then like two guys back, definitely not a police detective, takes the gun out of his pants, (laughs) 
True story. Puts it on the table, gives his life to Christ, gets baptized. It's an unlikely family, but isn't that what the gospel does? That's what the church is. It's an unlikely family. Have you experienced that? People that you never thought you would have anything in common with. Chris and I have experienced that just as friends and ministry partners. If you were to rewind the tapes 15 years ago, uh, you would find Gavin in the winter outside of Waverly pheasant hunting uh, on, on county roads, you know, like road ditches. Don't tell anyone. And if you were to rewind, that was my way of breaking the law. Chris, 15 years ago, was like stealing car stereos in North Omaha. <laughs> like <coughs> vastly different experiences. We had nothing in common. Like he likes sports. I don't even know. I don't even watch sports. I don't know how to do that stuff. Like... I shoot birds with guns. He holds it the sideways. Like, our, just our whole, just a different human experience. We had nothing in common, but we both meet Jesus, and all of a sudden we have everything in common because the most fundamental and foundational things in our lives is Jesus Christ. And now he's my best friend in the world. We're laboring in the gospel together. Isn't that what the gospel does? It creates unlikely families. And so let me press in a couple points of application from this before I move on to the next point. Number one, I just want to say, man, at City Light, we're going to celebrate and contend for diversity. I love that in this church, not everyone looks like me, acts like me, dresses like me, watches golf this afternoon like I will be doing. We're, we're different. This church would be so boring if we all looked the same. And, and diversity is not going to be the thing that we're about. The thing that we're about is Jesus and his gospel, proclaiming that. But we're going to celebrate that the kind of family that Jesus creates is an unlikely family. It's people, different ages, different races, coming from different nations, different parts of the city, different economic statuses. Diff- all of that comes together in one commonality, Jesus Christ. And we are an unlikely family. We celebrate God for that. Second application, I just want to say, we've got a vision to plant churches. And we've planted two by the grace of God. And they're coming in unlikely places, right? Benson seemed unlikely. It's like a mile from here. Why would you do that? I don't know. It just felt like that's what God would have us do. Council bluffs? Really? That's play too? I don't know. That's what Jesus said. And guess what? If you went to those places this morning, they're doing incredible. God is doing amazing things. Hundreds of people that aren't here that are in vastly different communities are hearing the message of the gospel preached this morning in unlikely places. And so I just want to say, as we go forward, Would our decision-making matrix for where and when we plant churches never be population density and median family household income and what makes the most sense? But would we be a church that prays, that pays attention to what the Holy Spirit is doing, and that follows and obeys Jesus even into unlikely places? Even into unlikely places. The church is an unlikely family. That's point one. Point number two is this. I want to get more into the text, uh, our text this morning. Point two is that The church is a grace-partaking and gospel-proclaiming family. Let me show you what I mean. Look at verses 3 through 8. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Remember, this is about 10 years after Paul has planted the church now. He's now gone on and planted some other churches. He actually writes this letter from prison, which we're going to talk about uh, in much greater length next week. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. Can't you hear in his tone how much he loves these guys? If you're new to your Bible, let me just catch you up. Paul is not like a touchy-feely, flowery kind of guy, okay? He, he, he's not like a let's sit down and uh, drink tea and discuss our feelings, you know, and watch a romantic comedy kind of guy. I mean, he's a doctrine guy, a truth guy, let's get past the warm fuzzies and get to the bottom line kind of guy, but you... You hear him in here, and he says, it's right for me to feel this way in my heart about you, how I long for you. And and the question is, why? What's with this warmth and affection in this community, in this relationship? I want to show you two reasons why. I don't think it's just fluff. I think there's a a gritty, solid foundation to this kind of relationship in the church. Number one, I want to show you verse 7. It says that they are 
partakers of grace. Partakers of grace. The word grace simply defined means God's undeserved love toward his people. It means that we, we don't deserve God's love. We deserve God's judgment. But he gives us his love and gives his son his judgment. It means God treats us like we don't deserve in its grace. What Paul is saying is that both Paul and the Philippians have, have come to an understanding of their sin, have felt convicted of their sin, and have experienced the radical, amazing, scandalous, counterintuitive grace of God to forgive their sin and to give them his presence and his peace and his Holy Spirit instead. Listen, when, when you understand that, that, that you deserve hell and God's wrath, but God sends Jesus to experience hell and God's wrath on the cross so that you can experience his love and kindness, that's grace. It's an amazing thing. And listen to me, when you really come to terms with that on a personal level, it changes you. I mean, that's personal. That's just not out there theology. That's neat. No, that's, that's my condition and my fate and my destiny. God has been kind to me. The hope that I have now because of Jesus, that, that changes me. And here's what happens. When you meet other people who have partaken of grace, it creates a bond between you that's unlike anything else, any other human experience. Partakers of grace together. I've been to China and Syria and Jordan and Poland, and I've been in church services where I don't understand a word they're saying. We have nothing in common with each other. We can't even greet each other, but you listen to their heart and worship and their Bible teaching, and you sit down, and you see the smile on their face, and it's like, you're my brother, you know? You know this Jesus. You've heard the good news. You've tasted grace. We are partakers of grace. And it's amazing the brotherhood you can have with a Chinese saint that you don't share anything in common because you are partakers of grace together. That's what the church is. We're partakers of grace. But then let me show you one more thing. Verse 5, he says that they are partners in the gospel. They're partners in the gospel. They're a gospel proclaiming church. So what happens? Paul goes in, preaches the gospel, plants the church in Philippi, likely leaves Luke, we find out about elsewhere, um, and then he gets run out of town. So he goes to other regions or other cities in Macedonia. He plants the church in Thessalonica and in Berea and in other areas. And what we find out is that it's the Philippian church, this church, that are his sending church behind him. And so um, they join him in his mission. So they're, they're funding his ministry and his future church plants. Um, they're praying for him consistently. They're sending food and resources to him. And even now, it's been a decade. He's in prison. We find out they send one of their church members, Epaphroditus, to take him supplies and money and support and to care for him when he's in prison. And the thing that made them such an amazing community is that they became a gospel team. They didn't just partake of grace and high-five each other and watch Netflix until Jesus came back, you know? They... They became a part of the movement, and the same grace that they partook in, they are writing checks, they are praying, they are serving together. They become a gospel-proclaiming team. They are partners in the gospel. Later on in 2 Corinthians, Paul is actually writing about this church, and he uses them as a good example. He says that from their poverty and with great joy, they gave generously to the work of God. These folks are poor. But they're giving generously and with joy because they love the gospel ministry of God. They became partners in the gospel. City Light, that's what we are. We are grace partakers and gospel proclaimers. A couple points of application um, to this point. Number one, I just want to say, hey, if, if you've experienced grace, uh, if you know that you're a sinner, Jesus has met you with grace, would you share that with someone in our church? Grace is the thing that brings us together. I, like, I mean, join a city group, make a friend, sit down for 10 minutes and tell someone where you've experienced the grace of God. Um, that's how you become a family. We're grace partakers together. I got together with a friend on Friday. Uh, we've known each other for about four years and uh, good guy. Um, I really like him and respect him. And so he's successful, he's articulate, he's good looking, he dresses good. And he kind of intimidates me because he seems to have everything together. So I've known him for four years, love the guy, but honestly, I don't know him that well. And we sat down on Friday and after some small talk, he opened up and just said, hey, here's some, here's some like heart issues that I've been struggling with and where I've experienced the grace of God and where I still need to experience it. And it was amazing in that moment 
um, like his vulnerability to share where he had and still needed to experience God's grace, it freed me up to open up and say, man, you're like, you're human. Um, I struggle with those same insecurities. I've had those same hurt issues. And it's amazing the bond that we felt in our weakness and our sin and our shared experience of the grace of God that we had never experienced in four years of telling each other how awesome we were. You know, it's kind of intimidated by me. I'm kind of intimidated by him. You're all posing. And no, 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 we didn't become friends through that. It was through our weakness and God's shared experience of grace in our lives that we became partakers of grace together. So I just want to encourage you, man, that's what church is. Would you share your story? Um, we actually become close friends through our weaknesses, not through our strengths. And the second thing I, I want to say is this, and I, I say it carefully. I, I, want to, I want to word this rightly. But if, you, if you're a consumer of church services and nothing else, I want to invite you for your good and your heart to become a partner in the gospel. In other words, man, if you come every week and sit and all that and eat donuts and appreciate the sermons and are part of this thing, but honestly, you've never written a check for one dollar, you've never served in any way, you've never contributed, um, I want to invite you in. And, and I was hesitant to say that because it drives me nuts when preachers manipulate people and pull on their heartstrings and try to give you to get get you to give more money and they drive off in their Bentley and the whole thing gets weird and then you get a legalistic culture where it's like you got to give more, do more, try harder, try better. And in your minds, even if you don't say it, you're thinking because then God will love me more if I do more, give more, try harder, do better. No, 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 no. Listen very clearly. The gospel says that Jesus has done everything for you to earn the favor of God, and that is a gift, and it's a free gift, and nothing you can give, serve, show up to, whatever, can change that in the least bit. That is God's grace, and that is the gospel. But here's what that does in our heart, is God saves us by grace. He then gives us his grace to partner in that gospel, and he uses that partnership to grow us and change our hearts and give us more grace. And so I, I, when I say, man, if you're not giving anything or doing anything, I I can say with a pure heart and the best motives that the one that's missing out is you. I say that for your good. No one else. Did you give $10 million today? I don't get a raise. We're not getting like gold-plated urinals in the bathroom. It doesn't work like that. We'll probably just go plant a whole bunch more churches because that's kind of what we've been up to uh, every time money comes in. But but what I am saying is that if you're doing nothing and wondering why you're not growing, it's because it doesn't work that way. It's like getting a gym membership to the Y Think, why am I just getting fatter? Well, do you work out? No, but I belong to the Y. Well, it's like it's a participation sport. Like you can't just show up and watch everybody else and like I wonder why I'm not growing. You gotta like do something, you know? And so I, I just wanna invite you into that. Um, would you give generously? Would you join the team? Would you serve? The seat that you're sitting in right now is someone else's sacrifice. The donut that we ate, I mean, someone labors for this whole operation, and it's our great joy to do it, and the invitation is to join the team. So I always want to say in moments like this, first off, City Light, you guys kill it. I've never been a part of a church like this church. You guys give so generously, and I never see a dollar amount with a name, and we set our accounting systems up that way intentionally, but I know that you guys give generously and regularly and sacrificially And there's things that you could own and have and do, but you don't because you are partnering in the gospel because that has become your greater treasure. And I just want to say, great job. So many of you, you, there's a thousand other things you could be doing other than opening up your home for a city group and making another casserole for a mom and reading the Bible to a six-year-old in an old basement um, or uh, mentoring a premarital couple. Like there's a thousand other things you can do, but for the joy of the gospel, you've partnered in the gospel. I just want to say thank you guys. You were pace setters. You're discipling me. I love this church family, and that's what we are. We are um, um, partakers of grace, and we are partners in the gospel. Last point. Last observation I want to make from this cool church in Philippi is that the church is a maturing family. The church is a maturing family. Um, Let's look at this now. We've read the first eight verses. In the first eight verses, it's super obvious Paul loves this church, They're not blowing it. They're actually doing a great job. They're rooted in the gospel. They're partnering in the gospel. And now what is Paul going to pray for his favorite church? Here's his prayer, verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more 
with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is really interesting to me. This is Paul's favorite church. He spent eight verses telling them how thankful he is. He thanks God for them all the time. They're killing it. And then when he gets to the prayer, he says, and I pray that the love that you already have that's so awesome that it would only increase and be more and more and more, verse 9. Verse 10, he says, I pray that you would grow in your knowledge and your wisdom and your understanding that you might know the heart of God, verse 10. Then he says, I pray that there would be a fruitfulness, a fruitfulness of righteousness through Jesus that brings praise and glory to God, verse 11. Here's what that shows me. When you really love someone, when you really love a community, when you really love a church, your prayer for them is that they would mature and they would grow. City Light, we are an unlikely family. We're a family that's grace partakers and gospel proclaimers. And my prayer for us us is that we would be a maturing family. Maturing family. I love my kids so much. I'm thrilled with where they're at. So proud of where they've gotten in life. But if in 15 years, I'm still tucking Grady into the top bunk of his bunk bed, saying I love you to the moon and back 257 times and getting a cup of water, something has gone really wrong. Do you understand that? It's really cute when you're six. When you're 21, you better get out of my house. I'm not tucking you into the top bunk anymore, right? When you love someone, growth is the goal. Maturity is the grow. Uh, The maturity is the goal. And so what that means for us as a church is that, listen, the church is a place where you can come as you are, but it's not a place where you can stay as you are. We're a maturing family, and there's an expectation and accountability that we are growing closer to Jesus and growing in our community with each other and growing in our love for our great city and the nations and giving our lives away. I love that Paul in verse 6, he, he has this expectation, this confidence. He says, I know this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I know he's going to mature you. And then verses 9 through 11, he prays for it. I pray that more and more and more you would mature and you would grow. And so what that means for us is that, listen, if you're here and you've never read the Bible on your own, you've never had like a personal devotional time, that's okay. You're saying, man, I've I've never given a dollar outside of what my own needs were. That's okay. I've never gone to a city group or confessed sin or encouraged someone else or helped somebody move or picked up a chair. And that's okay. But if next April 2017 you would say the exact same things, that's that's not okay, right? Uh, The goal is not to get to like St. Christopher Haruska level overnight. I mean, it it took him a while to get there, you know? We're not all going to get there, but the goal is maturity, and the goal is growth. And to know the saving grace of God then means to experience the sanctifying and changing grace of God and the growing grace of God in our lives. The church is a maturing family, and our God is not done with us city life. He matures his children. I want you to know this is good news to me personally. I met Jesus as an immature 17-year-old. It was amazing. God met me right where I was didn't have me change up, clean up, mature. He welcomed me because his son had died for me. His gift to me was free, and I received it, and it was amazing. But praise God, he didn't let me stay where I was spiritually, maturity, when I was 17. It was God's grace to put godly men in my life and a spiritual community around me, and he's deepened my character. There's things I used to struggle with. I don't struggle with them in the same way. And there's things I used to care about that God just rewired my desires. I I know the Bible a lot better now than I did when I was 17. I think more like Jesus now than I did when I was 17. I love God more than I did with 17. That's good news that he matures me. Listen, I'm not the man that I need to be, but I'm not the man that I used to be. And by God's grace, he's not done working in me. I'm maturing. And until I see Jesus face to face, I will be maturing. And City Light, that's what we are. The church is a maturing family. We're a, a growing family family. Trusting Jesus isn't the finish line of growth in the Christian life. It's the starting line. I'm out of time, so I should quit preaching now. Um, (laughs) I want to end with this. City Light, I love this church. I'm thrilled. The story that God has written here, couldn't have imagined it in a million years. Um, It's crazy. This is an unlikely family. 
And I love that this unlikely family understands that we are partakers of grace. Not a weird legalistic thing. It's not a way out there. We don't care about truth thing. It's a grace-centered, gritty, and gracious family. I love that we become partners in the gospel, that we are bought in, that we're not buying nicer chairs. We're planting more churches, that you guys give and labor for gospel ministry and revival in our city. I love that. And my prayer for this amazing church is that one year from now, we would look more like Jesus. Five years from now, we would love more like Jesus. Fifty years from now, we would be more committed to Jesus and his gospel than ever before until Jesus comes back to take us home. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we love the local church. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for this window in uh, to this amazing gospel witness in Philippi. And it's the same Holy Spirit, the same gospel, the same Bible that is here today in 2016. And here it is. I look out over a new expression of a very ancient church. Jesus, thank you for the church. Thank you for what you've done in this place. Thank you for the different stories and the different lives that are represented here. Um, Thank you for um, the foundation of grace and the commitment to the gospel. And Jesus, now we pray that. I pray very specifically. If there's men in the room right now that right now are passive in the home, never prayed with their kids, emotionally checked out when they come home, addicted to Netflix and work and the next golf tournament and the next escapism. God, that one year from now, they'd be praying over their kids at night. They'd wrestle with their kids on the floor. They'd be engaged with their wives in the home. God, I pray that for high school kids and college kids and young kids in the room right now, that maybe even doubting your existence and they're faced with a thousand pressures at school and they're seeking right now. God, that a year from now, they would be sold out for Jesus Christ, that they would be lights on their campuses. They would be more convinced and more committed that Jesus, you are the greatest treasure of life. And so Jesus, we give our church to you and we beg you, would you mature us? Would you sanctify us? Would you grow us in love and grow us in knowledge that he who began a good work in City Light Church would bring it to completion in the day of Jesus. Amen.